do not, wear, I can't wear bifocals, so <laughs> excuse the glasses switching. Um, I just want to thank you all and, and everyone for having me here today. It is such an honor to be back here uh, in my home. Um, I, I don't know if some of you may know, I ran the development office at Fatima School for 14 years. I came to school here. I was in the first graduating class at STM, so it was a real heartbreaker not to, you know, be in the last graduating class at Our Lady of Fatima High School. But um, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to be back. Um, and to be back in this capacity is such an honor. And to be with this group of you that, um, you know, my mom was a part of this group growing up. Ooh, love her. I know she's here in spirit with us today. Um, I want to thank um, some of my friends who are here with me. Um, my dear friend Kelly Mayard, my ride or die for a hundred years, and Roxanne and Bobby Lachule, new to my life, but ultra important, beautiful people that I love, and I thank you so much for being here to support me. Um, so today I am going to take you on a short walk through a part of my life that was really challenging and the things that sort of set me on the path to dedicate so much of my life to bringing people into the sacrificial love of Christ and what does that actually mean in the little moments in everyday life? It's the small stuff. And when I do these talks, this one was really scary because I'm like, what do I come say to the Catholic daughters that they don't already know? <laughs> and what can I bring that can be inspirational? And so I always begin this journey in prayer, and I'm like, okay, God, your words, these, this mouth. <laughs> and, you know, to try to remove myself from it. And, you know, what, it, um, and so he, he really brought me on the most incredible journey. Um, and, and so we're going to go on this little walk with the women that were in Jesus's life. And we're going to talk about our superpower and what their superpower was. And also, you know, our greatest gift is also the thing, our greatest area for our downfall. And so how does evil use our superpower against us? And we're going to kind of journey on that. and. Um, I'll give you a little background about um, how my journey began and how I had to really discover what my own superpower was and how to walk truly in faith. So in 1987, I was a junior in high school right here across the parking lot, and a friend and I got stranded on a country road nearby. We had been riding a motorcycle and it, it overheated. And a person posing as a good Samaritan stopped to help. And what he really stopped to do was to attempt to kill me, to end my life. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I'm going to share with you a little excerpt. I wrote a book about um, my whole journey. Um, I actually wrote two. This is the one that's published. The other one's not published yet. And I'm going to share a little excerpt from you with you about that day because that day has actually become probably one of the greatest gifts that God ever gave me was surviving that day. It, let me just share that day. And then we'll kind of talk about the journey that happened afterwards. Do I need to talk? Okay. Is that better? Okay, done? All right. 
<clears throat> and it's, um, it's chapter two, the chapters are super short. Evil on a sunny day. Um, this was a Sunday afternoon at about 1.30 in May, the month of May. He had a coldness about him that gave me the chills. Approaching the motorbike that lay on the ground, he beckoned. If y'all are stranded, I can give you a ride to get help. Do y'all live around here? I can take you to a phone to call someone. Or cell phones. His kind words drifted toward us with an edge that he tried to hide with a sweet sing-song voice. My senses flared as panic coursed through my veins. The more he talked and moved towards us, the more I sensed the danger. His shoes, white, athletic, and what is that country song written in red ink over the toe? His cap? Is that another country verse with iron-on letters across the front? He is way taller than me. I'm nearly 5'7", and he must be taller than six feet, I thought as my mind raced to snap picture after picture. On and on, my brain snapped photos of this man, his face, his clothing, his car. The more he spoke, the more I felt my veins tremble and my heart pump fear instead of blood through my veins. He seems so nice and he wants to help us, I thought, as he spoke. No, do not under any circumstances get into his car, since it's a screaming voice in my head. But we need help, we're stranded here, I thought. You are not stranded, walk to the farmhouse for help and do it now, I heard myself yell inside my head. Snap, 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 compulsively and beyond my control, my brain just kept taking pictures of everything around me. The license plate, we will need the license plate later, demanded the voice in my head. You must memorize the plate and do it now, it said. I stared at the plate and thought about why something was screaming at me to memorize it. I started to think, if I need to memorize the license plate, then it means I will need it later. If I'm going to need this information later, it means that I'm in danger now. Oh no, danger now, danger is bad, don't memorize the plate. If I don't memorize the plate, then I won't have it, and if I won't, don't have it, then I won't need it later, and if I won't need it later, then I'm not in danger now. No matter what, don't memorize the plate. Rationalize this oddly calm yet frantic voice in my head. I turned back into the conversation to hear this guy intensely negotiating with Jen. Look, just get into my car and I'll give you a ride to a phone so you can call for help. There's a store a few miles from here that I know has a pay phone. What's the big deal? Just let me give you a ride, okay? Looking at me for input, Jen started, um, stated in a questioning kind of way. Maybe one of us can ride for help and the other can stay with the bike. Before her final word had departed her lips, I rudely and abruptly interrupted her. No, we will just walk to the farmhouse and call for help there. This is a big motorbike and I can't watch it alone. Although my argument for walking was weak since we had already discussed the many reasons why we were not going to walk, she reluctantly agreed that we should forego the offer for a ride and walk. Woo, a bullet dodged, I thought as I grabbed our helmets, one in each hand. I stood there watching Jen lift the bike from the ground as the man got into his car, made a U-turn in the road, and slowly drove off. With a major feeling of relief, we began the one-mile trek across the sweltering asphalt to the farmhouse. Within seconds, a blood-curdling scream lurched from within my core and silenced sliced the thick, humid air like a knife. Jen stood frozen, unable to move, unable to help me. My arms now pinned behind my back, my elbows smacked together. Just before our intruder hoisted me into the air and flung me in the direction of his car, the picture of Jen's ghostly face became seared into my brain. Her vacant eyes broadcasted that fear had flooded her senses and shut down her ability to move and make sound. The whites of our eyes locked, fearing that this was our end. Chapter three, tell yourself to yell for help. 
Tell yourself to yell for help. Tell yourself to yell for help. Tell yourself to yell for help. I heard my shoulder pop out, then pop back in, but I didn't feel it as my arms were twisted and jerked behind my body. The grip on my arms was so tight and I was being hoisted into the air, yet somehow I kept my feet on the ground. I just don't know if that's true anymore because I was airborne at the same time I remember my feet on the ground. His breath was on my face as he smashed his head up against mine. Tear coursed through my body as my blood ran cold. It was suddenly freezing on this smoldering hot day. At once, I forced every ounce of air out of my body to propel from the core of my being the most shrill and horrifying sounding, help, help, help. Fingers, huge, disgusting fingers, now shoved into my mouth as I flung myself like a wild animal. His breath on my face, his lips on my ear, his words of terror flooding my mind. Shut up or I will cut your throat right here. Stop screaming now or you will die here. Silence. Why am I silent? The asphalt is my only hope. Cling to the asphalt for dear life. No matter what, don't get shoved into the car. More, more than on the asphalt is better. Just keep reaching for the ground. It's the only possible hope. What is he saying? Why can't I hear him? I can't hear him. I'm gonna die, he just said I'm gonna die. He said I have to shut up or I'm gonna be cut into pieces? Wait, that is why I'm silent. That is why I'm closer to the car. I'm still trying to get to the asphalt, but it's so much harder now. If he gets me into his car, I will surely die. Do not get into the car. Do not get into the car. Yell for help. Ignore him and yell for help, the voice inside my head pleaded. I hear my voice outside my body once more. I am screeching, help, help. The asphalt is closer, lunge toward the ground. Look at the ground and lunge. Rage pierced every word. I will cut you and beat you until you die if you don't shut up. Silence is the sound I hear. Ignore him and yell for help, I commanded yet again. Bellowing howls lurched from my core. Help, help, help. Keep lunging. If he is squatting, he is not moving to the car. It seemed to be my only plan. His outrage at my defiance came in growls. You will die. You shut up. Ignore him and yell for help. I continue to command myself. Hysterical screeching frantically filled the air. Help came from the depths of my core. His demands for my silence never ceased. Using force, he overpowered me, batting me around like a rag doll. Somehow my will to live became more powerful than his will to kill me. Even more frantic and more determined, my screams began to grow in power. Help, help. This unforgiving asphalt is my only hope. If he slams me, in, me into it again, it won't be the car. How are we at the car? I'm in disbelief. How did we get here so quickly? I'm stunned. I know I will soon die. I will not be shoved into the car. Still thrashing like a wild animal, my body and legs are now airborne. Feet first into the car. Right foot on the top of the door jam. Left foot on the top of the door hinge. Bent knees as he shoves me into the car with all his force. There is no more bend in my knees. We are flying through the air. My bent knees straightened with every ounce of force in my body. First his head, then my head, then together like bouncing balls on the asphalt. My arms, they are free. My body, it is pinned. His rage pulsing through his arms as they bind me to him. I am on top of him, I cannot see him. My hands are free. Flesh is pushing my fingertips to the bones. My nails are bending backwards. They do not hurt. His scream is a growl as he releases me to touch the places where flesh is missing from his eyelids and inside of his nose. Up and running. One second of freedom and up and running. I grab her by the hand. She is dead weight. 
her feet start to move with mine. Her stride is half of mine. I am five seven. She is five feet. I am running full throttle. She is keeping pace. The helmet, it should have hurt my back. The second helmet, it should have tripped me when it hit my ankle. It is him, he is not accepting a refusal. His rage is hunting me like a ravenous animal. Just keep running. I keep running. This is how it ends. <laughs> Give me some relief. Um, sadly, um, we got away from him that day. The following Friday, this was on a Sunday, the following Friday, um, a woman who was pregnant, he encountered her in distress and he, she begged him to spare the life of her baby and he beat her and left her for dead and bludgeoned her in the stomach until he killed her baby. He was a very brutal uh, human being. And um, she gained consciousness long enough to get his license plate. And with the information that I gave him, they were able to apprehend him and stop the madness. Um, so I share that because what happened on that day, I came to, I've come to understand that a person cannot give what they do not have. If I wanted to give you a million dollars cash every single day for the rest of my life, it would not matter how much I wanted to do that if I did not possess that. A person also cannot give love, dignity, and respect if they do not possess it. And this person did not have love. He did not know that he was worthy of love. And he had hatred and loathing and really toxic things with inside of him, and he shared that with me that day. Now, I had no idea what had happened. So much was stolen from me that day, but I didn't know it. I didn't know that the core of my being would carry on as though I were no longer worthy of love. A stranger came to me and said, you're not even worthy of your next breath nor are you worthy of love, you're worthless. Your life is worth nothing. My mind knew that he was wrong. My thoughts were completely out of sync with the messages that the rest of me received. And I had no earthly idea how to proceed how to heal from that. I kind of went to school on Monday. I told a couple of people about it. I was in shock and everyone thought I was fine. <clears throat> I then entered into a trauma bond um, with my first husband who had many, many addictions. And um, it was a tremendous mask to keep that kept me from God. I filled my life with another person's chaos and, um, and I learned so many incredible lessons um, about what was happening to me in that space, sort of in the aftermath of this one. And so, bringing it full circle to today. Um, one of the things that happened in the context of that relationship in a really exaggerated way um, was actually a, a tremendous blessing to me now. So being in a marriage with a person who has many destructive behaviors and not such great decision making and has a lot of consequences um, I had to suffer those consequences, you know, when that's, that's what life is, right? The people close to us make decisions and for better, or for worse, we, we go with the good and we're there for the bad. And there's a, a great amount of 
I can tell what's about to happen, right? Because like we've been down this path so many times and you start to really believe that, or know that you know what's best for the person. They're, it's a grown person making their own decisions and they're okay with the consequences, but I wasn't, right? And so I go down this journey, like really trying to force my will on another person, praying a prayer that God will never answer, ever, asking him to take someone else's free will away and make them do what I thought was best for them, not what he thought or what they thought, right? Um, so that's, that was just this real messy trap. And it was a beautiful gift in my life also because it set me on this spiritual journey of healing and recovery. And so today, um, I'm gonna transition a little bit and it'll sort of dovetail back in um, a little later. So um, we're gonna kind of talk about some of the women that were in Jesus's life and their journey with him and their superpower and your superpower. So we begin a, we're gonna begin with, of course, our Mother Mary, right? She was at the birth of Jesus, you know, Luke 2, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. There it is, evidence she was there. We know it, right? <laughs> Easy. Um, his mom was at the wedding at Cana. Um, when the wine ran out, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why does this concern us? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come, his mother said to the servants. Do whatever he tells you. I mean, doesn't that kind of sound like a mom prompting her kid? Hey, son, it's time to get this ministry on the road. Let's go. <laughs> He's like, but I'm having fun with my friends. I'm not ready to start. You know, you can see the true mother role. Like she knew and she was so encouraging right there. Um, and then on his journey to the cross, the women of Jerusalem, a large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him, right? So here we have this, this group of women, and he stops and he talks to them, and you know, he tells them, hey, I'm sin free. Look what they're doing to me. Imagine what they're gonna do to you. All the rest of you aren't sin free, you know? Um, he, and he kind of warns them about the pain that motherhood is, you know, that it's so painful. Um, and then um, the foot of the cross, right? Who's there? Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and her sister, who was Salome, who was John's mom, and I think that might be why he was there. I don't know if I say that in the Bible, but I would imagine his mom was like, hey, you gotta come too. Um, and Mary, the wife of Clopas, and that's uh, Joseph's brother, was Jesus' aunt, and Mary Magdalene, right? Another group of women. And then when the women go to anoint Jesus, the body of Christ, um, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and his two aunts, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so they could go and anoint the body of Christ. And what happens? They get there and he's not there. And then, you know, they run off because they're terrified. And um, then we have the risen Christ. Early on the first day of the week, after Jesus had risen, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. She went and told those who had been with him who were mourning and weeping, and when they heard that Jesus was alive and she had seen him, they didn't believe it. They didn't believe it. So, what is the common thread in all of these women? And probably all of you based on today. We show up. That's our superpower. We're there. We show up, right? All of these things happened. They never abandoned him. They were fearless. They were courageous. They were beautiful. It's incredible. They showed up. That's not all. Our love is powerful and fierce. You can see it in all of these stories, right? It's the common thread. It's in this room. We're daughters, we're wives, we're mothers, we're friends. It's, it's beautiful, we're loyal. They were so loyal to him. We're always there in good times and in bad to cry and to celebrate. 
they celebrated with him at weddings. They were there when he took his last breath. They celebrated when he came back. It's beautiful, right? They, they were there for all of it. We're strong. Imagine the strength that it took, not just because of the danger, right, of, of Roman soldiers and people crucifying Jesus and people. And, I mean, that's a dangerous situation, but that courage and the strength to witness it, I, I often wonder, could I ever have that kind of strength to witness the events that he experienced, over 5,000 injuries, right? And they were there for, for each one of them. Uh, pretty, pretty strong. We're intuitive and we get things done. They were getting things done. They were going to anoint him. They, I mean, you know, they were doing so many things. Mary Magdalene, you know, she was his benefactor. She, you know, was a huge support system um, during that ministry. Um, our superpowers are brilliant and beautiful, but here's the thing that I learned through all those hard, hard lessons. Evil can use our superpower to separate us from God. When we think it's a little more super and powerful than it is. And it's super small the way that it happens, but it's something that I've had to make myself really, really aware of um, because it separates me from God when it happens. And I never, ever want that separation. I never want it, me to be responsible for putting that divide there. And so, evil works in two ways to separate us from God. One, he convinces us that we're not worthy of love. That when that happened, Jesus on that cross, that it wasn't necessarily for me everything that I ever did wrong and everything I'm ever going to do wrong. He convinces me by sending someone to try to kill me that that didn't really matter for me. That's for other people. I didn't think it, but I felt it and believed it in my core. And that's trauma. It's a very common response to trauma of any kind, bullying, abuse. I mean, y'all know what trauma is. The other thing, so here's the thing, right? In 1 John, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So anytime we are convinced that we are not loved, are not worthy of love, we don't know God. We have to be in a state of love to know God. It says it right here, right? He convinces us that we have God's power. It's the other way that he uses our superpower against us. And so whenever the battle broke out in heaven and uh, St. Michael, the archangel, and, you know, Lucifer had their, their fight, it was because in Isaiah, it tells us, I will ascend above, this is what Lucifer said, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds, I will make myself like the most high. Okay, just think about those words. I will make myself like the the most high. He wanted God's power. So think about it, right? If he convinces you that you're not loved, and he convinces you that you have God's power, you're separated from God. 
you're not standing in the light. You stepped off into a dark place and don't even know it. So, okay, I need two, my two volunteers. life-changing scriptures in the entire Bible because it's something that happens to us that is so subtle and we miss it and it's the thing that keeps us separate from God okay so Annie you read uh, just the ones that are highlighted so do y'all know what Bible Hub is when you go and you put um, you pull up a scripture and then it shows you every single Bible and how that scripture is written in every single Bible. Okay, so the sheets that they have are, um, what is it, Psalm 94, 11, and, um, and John, 1 John 3. Okay, and it's very really interesting the way that these go together. Okay, Anna, you read yours, and then Catherine, you read yours. The Lord knows all human plans. He knows that they are futile. God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Just do a few more. Just read the different words that are highlighted. Worthless, breath, vanity, meaningless, vapor, vain, Useless, senseless, pointless, morally bankrupt. Those are, read the sentence before it. Those are what God knows God. the thoughts of people are. Okay? God is greater than our conscience and that he knows everything. Okay, so who knows everything? God. What do we know? Nothing. <laughs> right? Okay. So, thank y'all. Appreciate you. Um, okay. So, in the human condition, one of the things that we do, I'll give my own example. I had a person very close to me making very destructive decisions in his life. Um, and I needed this person to make other decisions than the one he was making. And I decided I knew what was best for him. And I tried to impose my will on him, right? Okay, so one of the ways that we do this is that we take events from our past, we project them into the future, and then we waste the present believing these thoughts that we have. We're intuitive. We're really intuitive, right? But our intuition is like a message from God. But one of the things that happens is when God talks to us, he doesn't necessarily give us all the information. So we have a lot of blanks. And it's really difficult to be still and to be quiet and to wait for the rest of the information. So we fill in the blanks and we believe the thing that we use to fill in the blanks. 
and then we give advice with it. We make plans over it. Most of the time, though, we create these really terrible things in the future, and we waste the present worrying about them. Um, I do uh, spiritual coaching and things like that, and um, this person said I could share this, this story. Um, I had a person, and she was having some difficulty with her grandchildren, and it was around Christmas time. And they had made a stop before coming to her house. And they were taking long. And things had not been going well. And she started to worry. And then she started to get upset. Oh, well, they're over there celebrating Christmas. And I'm not invited to the thing that they're at. And they're over there having fun. And they're really enjoying themselves. And I'm being left out. And she started to get herself very upset and very worked up about it, right? It seems reasonable. I mean, they're not there. No one's calling. They're just not showing up yet and clearly they're having a grand old time without her and she called me or I called her something told me to call her it was Christmas Eve and she starts to tell me all these things that they're all doing and I was like whoa you know you just made all that up <laughs> that's a fiction about what people are thinking if you think you know what someone's thinking you're making it up you don't know Unless they tell you, if you know what, think you know what they're doing, and they didn't tell you, or you don't see it, you don't know. You don't know what's in a person's heart and a mind and their, and their being. We don't know. We don't know what the future holds. So I'm going to share this fabulous example. It's one. This scripture is just so powerful, and I always come back to it. So. During the time of Jesus' ministry, when he tells Peter that he's the rock, and then he starts to warn them all about his death, right? What's going to happen? He starts to tell them about his crucifixion upcoming. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And he says, far be it from you, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. We all know what happens next, right? But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Why did he say that? He wasn't calling Peter Satan. Satan was convincing Peter that he had information about the future that he didn't have. Yes, Jesus just told him something terrible is about to happen. Okay. For sure, yes, something terrible is about to happen. We're right about that piece of it. What Peter didn't know was that God was going to take that terrible event and make it the greatest gift that he ever gave to humanity, to the world, to us. He tells Peter, this is really key. You are a stumbling block to me. Or you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Remember the thing we just read? What's he saying right here? He's saying those two scriptures, the psalm. You know nothing. Peter, you don't know. God knows everything. You can't think like God because you're not God. And if God didn't reveal it to you, you don't know. You don't know. And so, left to Peter, devices, right? He would have done whatever he could to prevent the greatest gift God ever gave the world. Imagine. Because why? He didn't know. I didn't know what God had in store for the person I was married to. I didn't know the journey God was going to take him on. I didn't know how he was going to use these things that are going on in this person's life to transform them and to who knew he was going to take this day that a person tried to kill me to place me at this podium imagine imagine what he can the, the beauty that he makes out of the worst stuff and so we have to believe in the beauty and so our superpower is that strong intuition, that smart, those, the, the, all of those things can be used against us when 
we think that they are greater than they are when we believe our thoughts when we make up stuff and then we think that it's true and we hold people accountable to things that we make up we there's so many ways that we um we slip into that place without realizing it and so the antidote for that of course is to pray for wisdom because wisdom is a gift that God gives us, and he allows us to see ourselves, the people around us, our lives, our situations through his perfect lens and not our very flawed ones. Um, and it's in our flawed lens that we create these scenarios that aren't true, never going to be true, don't exist, and, and we waste a lot of time responding and reacting to them. Um, and so... I'm going to bring us to a close. Okay, where's those little lights? Y'all have little lights on your table? Mm -hmm. huh? Here we go. Okay, all right. So this is what we're gonna do. I want everyone to get one of these little lights and turn them on. And there's a little button on the bottom and you're gonna hold them in your hand. Okay, so this exercise is, um, is called Light of the Soul. Oh, you know what? Before I start this, I want to back up real quick because there's one thing that I did want to share with you that I wrote on here. Um, the way that we help people in our life who are in distress is not to pretend like we know the answers. It is to pray and ask God to remove everything from their lives that leads them away from him and to ask God to fill their lives with people and experiences and events and things that lead them to him and to not be committed to our outcome for other people's lives. We have to be committed to God's outcome. And we can never pretend to know what that looks like. My daughter is in, I prayed that prayer for my daughter when she was going through some tough times in college. And he sent her to the Philippines as a missionary for three years. I said, did you just take me out of my kid's life? <laughs> and he had. <laughs> that was hard. <laughs> okay, here we are. Light of the soul. Um, okay, so I'm going to play some music. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to take a walk for a moment into a prayerful place of God's most perfect love. At the very moment of your creation, your DNA came together from your parents. And God held you in his hand. And he breathed his breath into you. He gave you your soul, your light. He placed it inside of you. And he perfectly loved, perfect you. You had done absolutely nothing to earn or deserve his love, his breath. His life, his piece of you that he placed in you, you were so perfect as his beautiful creation that he simply adored you and loved you. And so if I asked you, where is your light? Where is it? Mine is right here. I always know where mine is. Is your light lost? Do you know where your light is? Do you know where your soul is inside of you? Where is it? Is your light shining for all the world to see, to stand in, to know the love of Christ through your light? Where is your light? So I'm gonna play a little song and during this time, I want you to hold this light in your hand. You can lift the light and close your eyes. 
and want you to pray and ask God to take you back to that perfect moment where he was holding you and he breathed his breath into you and loved you. Hey, I'll leave you with your light. Be beautiful. Be in love.